uh, our campaigns are not always easy campaigns because we actually think uh, politics should be about taking positions. And uh, sometimes they're uncomfortable and sometimes uh, they create you to become a lightning rod. But I think in the long run, it's better to, uh, to stand for something and, and, and deal with the consequences of one's position than to stand for nothing and never know why. Uh, facts will not be terribly relevant in this election. Uh, and and uh, Democrats will be responsible for everything under the world. We'll be responsible for the recession, the deep recession that we're in. We're going to be responsible for the state of the economy and the unemployment. We're going to be responsible for this big government takeover. We're going to be responsible for broken, failed border and immigration policy. We're going to be responsible for chlorine in the water. <laughs> We're going to be responsible for the national deficit. We're going to be responsible for the failed wars and the quagmire we still find ourselves in in Afghanistan. And we're going to be responsible for BP and the disaster in the Gulf. Why we're responsible is because it's a very convenient disease that the Republican Party has, and that's selective amnesia. And so it's going to be our fault, uh, not theirs. They share no part in the situation this nation finds itself in. They have just sat by, they've been innocent bystanders, and watched this all occur. Uh, they have no responsibility for the hole that we're in, and frankly, no appetite to help the American people dig themselves out of the hole that they put us in. And so I kind of see only two routes for, for not only myself, but for, for our party as a whole. Uh, one of the routes is the if we want to survive this election. One of the routes is to uh, kind of hide from the issues, embrace the rhetoric of our opposition and use it to an advantage, blame those progressives and those demanding Democrats for wanting more from their government, and uh, hide in the political tall grass and hang on. And that might be a road to victory. Uh, or we can stand up and fight for the change that we need in this country and that remains unfulfilled. We can stand up for Social Security and say it's not just about privatization. It is about no raising of the retirement age to 70 and no cut in benefits. We're talking about a deficit reduction issue Ladies and gentlemen, Social Security did not cause the deficit. We have, uh, as we wind down in Iraq and as we struggle to find out what we're going to do in Afghanistan, I always find it uh, somewhat hypocritical that maybe of the strongest deficit hawks that we have in Congress and in the House of Representatives are the first ones to fall over themselves to continue to pay up to $1.4 trillion for two wars that are not paid for. To my friends, the deficit hawks, don't be hypocrites. If you want to continue to fund this wars that we've been in, find the resources. You know, this is the first war. This is the first conflict we've been in which our country has instituted massive tax cuts at the same time that we are running a bill up of $1.4 trillion. Never in the history of this nation have we done that. And so if you want to, find the money and talk to the American people honestly that this 1.4 trillion will be paid and it adds to the deficit of this nation. Unequivocally, because I'm not ashamed of it and I do not hide from it, say that President Obama has been outstanding in the face of one inherited crisis after another. We've done good things for Native Americans in this country, and it was about time. <laughs> we 
We've done good things for veterans. I am proud of that, and this Congress should be very, very proud of what their record they have with veterans in this country. <laughs> I mentioned health insurance reform. More has to be done, but I am proud of that decision, and I'm proud of that vote. I'm proud that we opened up higher education to more people and made it more affordable. I'm proud of the clean energy development and jobs that are being created, and I think those are things that we should be proud of. The Recovery Act saved and created 3.5 million jobs. Can you imagine if we had followed the people that are talking about the stimulus shouldn't have been done, it was big government, it shouldn't have ever happened, can you imagine the unemployment and the economic situation that this country would be in right now without that one month into that administration, we were dealing with this, this, this administration, we were dealing with a recovery plan that was needed in order to stabilize the very financial infrastructure of this country. And let me just uh, say that I defend with no reservation our proposal to offer the people who harvest our crops, tend our gardens, work in our restaurants, care for our children, clean our homes, a chance to be legal citizens of this country. And before... And before I take credit for that very, very inspiring quote, I, I was quoting John McCain, 2007. <laughs> and, uh, and I couldn't agree with him more. <laughs> the immigration policy, I think, speaks to, to many fundamental questions. It's a very serious matter for this nation, about the life of our nation. What does it mean to be an American? What does it mean to become an American? How do we continue our successful experiment with diversity? What continues to make the United States such a unique nation? Our answers to these questions profoundly affect all of us, both publicly and privately, and constitute, I think, a very, very important aspect of the American experience. Unfortunately, immigration policy is also very fertile ground for divisive political rhetoric, often full of unspoken assumptions about immigration, about economics, and the American culture. This, this rhetoric holds that immigration, whether for cultural or economic reasons, needs to be reduced. It holds that undocumented immigrants are a vital threat to national security and to the safety of communities everywhere. It holds above all that we must secure our borders before any other f further policy changes can be discussed. And this, my friends, has taken center stage in the debate. And I think that the American people are going to demand some solutions from us to this issue. Now, is it going to be what I want in immigration reform? No, I know that. Is it going to be a common ground on issues of security, on issues to a path to legalization, on issues of work workforce migration and how you gauge that and how you permit it? Yes. That's what it's going to take. It's going to take an integral, comprehensive look, not a jaded look at immigration. Because I pretend that we're, if we let this issue continue to dominate the division, what's going to happen is, to, is, is more frightening to the social fiber of this country than anything else. And, and you know, as a son of an immigrant, the experience is uplifting. The experience is special. And the identification with this nation is eternal. So let's look at immigration 
with its human equation, minimize the rhetoric, try to be factual, and look for common ground. I'm willing to do that. And I think many of us are willing to do that. <laughs>